call them reactivated because we've um, delivered them before with different guest speakers and different content. And so we have a page later in the resource, which I'm sharing the screen of now, which um, is a kind of new title page for all the new bits starting from this page. Um, we started using, I'm a keen landscape photographer and, and nature photographer, and we started using my pictures when we started these reactivated sessions. So this is an example here. And actually I'll come on to that topic when I'm doing my guest slot later. Um, the idea of the reactivated sessions is they're more flipped, more focused on activities and more rooted in real experience because we have additional practice practitioners, new guest speakers and so on. Um, there's also a link to our journeys and a step by step guide on how you can register and access those journeys and that's uh, a step by step guide later in the resource. Um, Alistair, you're you're going to talk about the self-access resources. Should I stop my sheet screen sharing? Uh, yes, I thought it was Lillian going to talk about what people said in registration first. Yep. <laughs> Have we skipped okay. the slide? Oh, yeah, yeah. just very quickly. Um, this is the second version of our webinar. We last ran the webinar in 2019. Um, so it's quite useful for you to kind of go back uh, to the page where people said what they wanted to learn in, when they're attending this webinar, because there's a, quite a difference, quite a shift since the pandemic. A lot more people have been working online. So most people have kind of hinted at the fact that they want this time round uh, to find out a little bit more about building communities um, and also um, how they can cater for more diverse needs, um, international students, um, and also how to create more accessible resources, which is lovely to know that it's in people's minds nowadays, okay? So you can access this slide uh, yourself um, uh, on our learning resource when we share the link. Over to you, uh, Alistair. Okay, thank you very much. So what I want to do just to give you a sense of what the other 35 slides or so were that we're not gonna be focusing on today, but just to give you a sense of what is there, for you to come back at any point and maybe at this point Lillian or Ron could share the uh, the link for folk um just a quick overview last time um we had the recording of the session where we went through each of those 30 odd pages talking about them getting feedback from people uh, it was a very active very fast paced session um in particular draw your attention to a few of the the links that I've got here um, as kind of recommended reading. Well, that's an interesting one. So um, I'll come back. I won't do that. That pop up. Obviously, I've got something wrong in there. Um, but there is a mind map um, for designing online activities, and we've updated that as well. So it's got a few more links in it than it had before, but it covers a huge area. So do have a look at the mind map, um, which is on about page seven of the original resource. Um, we've got some lighthearted but serious clickbait teasing on um, on Brexit, cell phones and toothbrushes, making points there about the importance of kind of engaging people, but also um, looking at that content, you find there's some really helpful information about the sorts of things that you really need to take into account um, on uh, designing resources so here we are the uh, the legislation is in there lawyers hate you knowing surprisingly fatal designer death wishes common compliance um, failures and one weird trick that actually really helps you in terms of you creating good content um, we've got uh, there's a helpful uh, overview of relevant future teacher sessions um, again it looks like i didn't quite get that link right uh, my my coding skills leave something to be desired um, and then uh, we've got a range of models because there's about four or so other future teacher sessions on rich media um, audio um, using images and so on we've got lots of models we had lots of um, models some we created ourselves a brain-based infographic and the goldilocks model and then through to other pedigree type models like arcs lashings of cognitive science in there as well each of those links you to the original uh, resource pages um, 
some low-tech tasks, some high-tech tasks. So whether you're um, digitally very competent or digitally a beginner, there's great things you can do if you get the pedagogy right. Um, and then we've extended the ARCS model to a really helpful checklist that we do encourage you to have a look at the scary. It was the ARCS model, but we've added I for inclusion. So along with the zombie theme, this is the scary checklist where you can go down and just have a look at the content you're creating and see which literally see which boxes it ticks. So we've got some post session tasks that we do encourage you to look at. Um, and that will be really effective reflection if you have a look at some of those tasks. But without any more ado, I'm going to pass back now to Lillian for the Mentimeter. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I have added a link in the chat uh, for a Mentimeter, um, uh, a little bit of participation from people. Uh, and I am just going to... I'm just trying to find the tab where I've got my um, resource. Let me just bob along to that. Um, and yeah, so I'm hoping that people will uh, look at the link in the chat uh, as I share the screen. Uh, so don't be clicking on the screen that you see in the webinar. Uh, use the link that I've added in the chat and you'll be able to um, just select uh, your options on the page, okay? And we'll just give people 30 seconds to uh, participate in that uh, poll. And then as people submit at the bottom of the screen we will be able to uh, show you the results uh, it's not loading i've just seen someone saying in the yeah chat, quite a loading couple thing. of people having a problem with that loading so uh should i share the actual mentee yeah share the voting link which I will add the, I do apologize. We're having kind of like uh, problems with uh, links today. So I've added a new link. Oh, Rachel, thank you. Yeah, it could just be the number of people accessing that uh, Xerti page at the same time. Um, but I've added the link to the actual mentee itself. Um, and so that, that should tolerate <laughs> lots of people um, absolutely uh, accessing it at the same time. And then uh, what we'll do is we will wait and see how many results we get from people. Okay. So last time we ran this poll, we were able to um, maybe uh, gather 75 results. And uh, the, the results from the last poll are linked on the uh, Xerti object, which you can visit after the webinar is over as well. Um, and we thought it would be quite interesting to kind of capture that difference pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Um, I said to Alistair and Ron, I suspect the amount of video will have increased significantly. Uh, and we're really curious to know if, for instance, there will be um, quite, quite a, a reduction in PDFs because we know PDFs are um, seen as less accessible. And just based on the number of uh, participants at the moment, you can already see our predictions have, have happened. Um, we've got more videos than we had last time, way less PDFs uh, than we had uh, in 2019. So I guess things are looking up, way more learning objects as well. Ron, you'll be pleased to know. Okay. Um, so uh, our next, oops, our next speaker is uh, John Fanning. Uh, I'm going to stop my sharing for a minute and allow John to share his screen. Uh, I'm also going to introduce uh, John is a lecturer at the University of York. He's also joined by two graduate training uh, teaching assistants, uh, Chia Lu and uh, I can't remember your other person's name. Chia Lim. 
Yeah, Jalen. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and they'll be sharing their screen and uh, presenting on uh, online activities. Um, and some people in our sign up list mentioned about gamification as well. So John will speak to that very, very nicely. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that from people who uh, signed up for the webinar, lots of people were interested in um, engaging and building up communities with postgraduate and international communities. John's your man. So feel free to ask him questions in the chat as they do their presentation. Over to you, John. I'm not hearing anything at the moment. Hi, sorry about that. It's over complication of technology. I've got a, quite a nice little setup here, but it means I can't actually see Zoom. <laughs> So uh, once Zoom disappeared, I couldn't actually unmute, find it to unmute myself. Can you see my screen now? No. Um, we can't see your screen, but we can hear you. Good. I'm going to, I'd shared my screen and then I couldn't actually access the things because, uh, okay. There now we, we go. now we've got both. You've got 10 minutes. Okay. I'll start the time with myself then. Can you see Great. It? Okay. Thank you. I'm here to, we have a module that's been set up for a while, for about seven or eight years using a fairly complex interactive strategy game. Uh, which we'll give you very brief details about. There is a, vi a longer video we've made, which is about half an hour long, which gives a bit more detail if you're really interested in the game. And, and also in that, in that gives you some more detail on the complexity of the communities we can build up. Uh, so we'll be letting that video go out later, but this is obviously 10 minutes. Uh, it's effectively, we had about a week to turn what would be was a complex in-person game into a, a, an in an on practice game. And I think Jay Ling and Presley will have more to tell you about that because they were the ones who carried a lot of the weight for that. Uh, to say, you know who I am, I'm John Fanning. Uh, the other two people we, you'll be talking to are Jay Ling Bai, who's, uh, who first we called Presley, and Jay Ling Han. They're both second year PhD students, PhD students in the Department of Management, and they'll be helping, uh, they helped out on this with the strategic planning. Jay uh, that. Okay, the, the main interest that we had here about this going through the is that we have two types of strategic thinking, uh, strategica staccatis, which is the classic one, and anticlastico staccatis, which is reflective thinking. Uh, and then we use those to look at the models. So we, the philosophy of the, model, of the course can be simply summed up as all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Which is a quote from George Box, who's a statistician, but I think it very much applies to strategy uh, in that. The students are assessed on 20% of their game performance, which isn't how, whether they win or lose, it's how their, their team operates within the game and how they do the thing. 20% on the group video and a forward plan they make at the end. Uh, they used to do presentations. We had already changed the video before COVID. Uh, and then a 60% personal essay on reflective essay, uh, which is often that's this anticlastico approach and the two early ones are, are more strategic costs but we do have a different do that. There is a small peer reviewed element in the assessment. I say small because it is not worth many marks. It become, becomes a major source of conflict. Students are very much taken up with showing what they did. And this year was no different, even with the, with the online compute complication over what had been done and what hadn't been done. Uh, so that's very kind of an interesting part of the building of communities and calling disputes sort of going forward. Uh, it's, a very diverse cohort. The, I would say that about a third of the 35 students this year were from South Korea, but apart from that, they're very much spread across all six continents. The only continent that has not yet turned up on the module is Antarctica. So if anyone knows a penguin that wants to study strategy, they could let me know, It'd be very useful. The classrooms are already flipped, or lectures were already pre-recorded and they were placed online. Now, some people seem to have felt this would have made it easy for us to adapt. But like I said, the game itself was, I was surprised how much of the game relied on students just learning to talk to one another and get on with another, one another. So mix them together. Anyway, it's public administration. It's about impact rather than with profit. So. 
Well, uh, back to the outside, so due to the COVID circumstances, the session has been uh, removed, uh, moved uh, in, entirely online. And uh, uh, most students are international and mature students uh, uh, in this module. So in order to let them get familiar with each other as fast as possible, we decided to play a little game, uh, Bucket of Doom. Uh, this game is not only an icebreaker, but also guided students who use tools reaching for, uh, between the Zoom room and the VLE discussion board. Um, so basically, we uh, met the, in the main Zoom room first, explaining uh, to the students how it works, and they needed to find their group discussion board uh, on the VLE. Then we uh, set up uh, 10 entries, as you can see on the screen, prior to the session. Um, next, uh, they, uh, they've they been given a, a scenario of death via the via, via announcement here. Uh, in order to avoid the death, they had to uh, choose one of those items and in reply to the right how it would help them uh, escape the death. Um, and uh, here's one example of the response uh, of one uh, group. And then the uh, students have been asked to return to the uh, main room to get the feedback uh, of their responses uh, and each group uh, shared um, their escape plans. Everybody voted the, the best plan. The winners got one point and then they draw, uh, we draw another uh, death scenario and they repeat it for um, each best plan. Um, they've been rewarded uh, um, to their initial investment allowance. And therefore, this can be regarded as a motivation uh, to the students uh, engaged in this module, starting with the game. So, so I'll introduce how the game run. So I'll start from the structure. The background of the game, there are six teams with individual roles, and the students will divide it into six teams, and namely it's six pavers in the continent. And you see this picture, the first seven is the non-player and the last six groups is the six powers and the, the six groups of students. And that's the initial game map. The details will be in the video and the initial relationships table for the students. And the, the better the, the, the relationship students get, the better their invest, uh, the, the more uh, possibility for their, they win the investment. And there are six moves, one move each week. Students will make their decisions through discussion board. And that's the maps after the first move and the final move. And just for the confirmation, you can see the difference. And for the spreadsheet, there's some factors affect the students' uh, marks, the strategy and the cooperation. The strategies is students, they make their decisions uh, on the discussion board and we give students an impact modifier of bit modifier between of uh, 50% and to 200%. And the more well researched the strategy, the higher modifier students get. And we encourage the cooperation between different groups. Uh, then that's the discussion board and the group journal. You see students uh, post their results and the discussion result on the discussion board. And some, uh, some, some of them just post, post their opinion of different countries in the politicals, uh, in the politics and some uh, other in te te technologies. And uh, after we read it, we will give them modifiers and John will write the comments. All the discussions took place totally online, replacing face-to-face -face teamwork meetings and intra-team meetings. Uh, to agree this treaty, st the students had to arrange their own online discussion between groups. Sometimes they, are, they arrange a Zoom meeting or in the collaborate room. And that's a contract, a formal contract between two groups. And uh, maybe uh, the contract can be signed by the foreign ministers, the role in their groups. In terms of the uh, student engagement, uh, we've actually um, asked their expectations in the first uh, um, online workshop. As uh, Jalen just mentioned, the module usually runs face-to-face. -face. It's the first time we work together delivering this module online. Uh, well, surprisingly, we got uh, um, 32 responses. 
out of the total 35 students. And then, um, you can see they found it interesting about the module here and uh, modules teaching design and even ask for more games. And also um, they've been engaging in their group work on a regular basis as we ask them to post their answers of each um, session's tasks uh, um, on their group journal or blogs. And taking an example of one group, as you can see on the screen, they post their moves and the reasons behind the, that uh, using some theoretical frameworks to analyze in detail. So this can be another proof of uh, the students' uh, active engagement. Uh, what is particularly um, impressive is the in-camera use of these master students. As you can see on the slide, which is a screenshot um, of uh, one of our online sessions, most of them had turned their cameras on. And this phenomenon actually uh, remained throughout the term, even when each of us checked our uh, allocated groups in each session. They mostly uh, turned their cameras on. Um, it was much appreciated uh, indeed. I, I'm not going to take up more of your time by going on about the, who's the winner and who's the losers of the game. Only there was a massive amount of involvement. It was very complicated. One of the interesting things with the students commenting was that they had, uh, it took them a while to work out what was going on. Uh, and, and in the end, the winning team won by 0 0.3 of a victory point out of 528 to 0.7 to 429. That's so it's 0.01% difference, which I think showed a really big collective involvement and commitment to the game. Uh, just very briefly, the, the average mark overall was 65.8%, 68.5%. So no formal feedback, but they took a lot of it online. All this is on the video. Thank you for your time. That's excellent. Thank you very much. So any questions for John, add into the chat pane and um, John can answer those as we go through the session. And now we're very pleased to have Vicky Liogier. And Vicky's been involved, um, she's been the, the, the kind of driving force. And let me share my screen for a minute, just by way of intro, and then I'll let Vicky share hers. Vicky's been the uh, driving force behind the digital teaching uh, platform, the enhanced digital teaching platform, 200 plus uh, resources, free bite-sized material. So it's part of the digital professional teaching framework. And um, so there's information on the background to this. It's a massive project. It's all free. It's well worth looking at. And um, Vicky's given some slides as well that you'll find on, on the learning resource uh, to give more background. But what we're going to do now is we're going to focus with Vicky on the designing of the, the the core content that you get to down at the bottom and how that's been designed um, in a way I believe is uh, is a model of uh, good online learning design. So Vicky, I'm going to stop sharing and pass over to you and and get you to tell us a little bit about your template driven approach and why you chose that kind of micro learning style and whatever else. And if you want me to put any links in the chat pane, then um, I can do that. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I can't share my video for some reason. Um, when I click on it, it doesn't actually uh, let me to. Okay, don't worry. It's, um, there's been all kinds of tech. Okay, so share your screen. That's the key thing. Yeah, cool. So I'm going to uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. I have not started a presentation as such, except for the slides uh, you already have, but I can talk to you and share with you uh, the platform, uh, which is the Enhanced Digital Teaching Platform. So it was, um, it's um, part of what we would call our EdTech Comp project, but we, uh, started in 2018, and we started by uh, creating a net tech uh, a digital teaching professional framework because we wanted a clear understanding of what pedagogic approaches should look like with new technologies. And as you know, there was a, a, a really uh, fundamental issue between uh, the use of learning technologies and the disconnect with uh, pedagogic and uh, 
tech, pedagogy and technology. And what we wanted is to create, uh, to take down barriers to uh, professional engagement of educators and responding to just in time, uh, self-identified uh, training needs. So it's totally free to access the platform. You don't need to register to access content. And uh, the framework is now mapped with 175 micro learning modules. You'll be able to see the framework here. I'm just going to show it to you quickly and there's uh, more links for you to uh, actually uh, look at it. So although it's structured in a linear manner, it's not meant to be approached uh, in a linear way. So when we, uh, we created that framework first, and then we uh, sent for an invitation to tender, and uh, we commissioned both the uh, platform to be fully adaptive and uh, uh, responsive to any device, as well as creating the content. And that was done in that October uh, uh, 2018, and we launched at BET in uh, January, on the 25th of January, 2019. So as you can see, it was very tight. And that uh, time constraint uh, effectively affected uh, the look and feel of the modules uh, for the best, I believe. Um, in our, in our, um, in our ITT, we wanted uh, five minutes long micro learning modules. And that in itself was quite, um, was quite a, a conflict uh, with uh, various ped pedagogic approaches that existed at the time. And uh, I had a lot of um, colleagues who, who would say, well, Vicky, but what can you learn in five minutes? How can you go into that kind of depth of uh, learning. And uh, my understanding was that there was a mindset that we needed to break and that mindset needed to be shifted to uh, by drop by drop. And the five minutes was enough to my understanding to give ideas to uh, uh, practitioners and trainers. And uh, that's what we try to do. So this is the enhance. Uh, as you can see, we've got uh, uh, latest updates. But I'm giving a quick, quick, quick. And then the modules, if you're registered like I am, and you can see it here, uh, you will get the modules that may interest you. And then um, essential digital skills and the most popular modules, the latest one. And I'm just going to open to this module here, uh, which is our featured module at the moment. So all the modules are created under the same template in order to uh, have a consistency of experience and structure uh, generally. The badging structure, as you can see here, was also created alongside uh, the modules. So uh, when you go into the modules, you're going to have a short description. You can see here that uh, uh, individuals who have completed the modules can rate it. So aim, objectives, the it links to the digital teaching professional framework. And then uh, you're going to have, if the module uh, is available for two and three star badges, you're going to see uh, reflections that have uh, been inspired uh, uh, from uh, by this module, by this training. And if you go here, you'll see all the reflections that were inspired. And then it will tell you if you're interested in this module, a kind of Netflix approach really, then these are the modules that you may want to take afterwards. Uh, on the side here, you can see all the further resources uh, which are embedded, sorry, embedded in the modules are also provided as a link. And then you'll see the feedback from practitioners with various reviews and stuff. And you could see at the beginning, I've put loads of hearts. <laughs> So um, let's go into the module itself. The modules are structured across three performance um, stages. The adopting stage is green, and it's for those of us who are already embedding at tech in our practice. The blue stage is for those of us who don't know anything, it's exploring, and uh, leading stage is for those of us who are um, already 
able to uh, support others and critique what uh, ed tech approach may be more suited for a given learning context. So all the modules are structured in a similar manner. As I said, you've got an introduction once you are in it, then you're going to have a, a small animation, uh, generally no more than three minutes. And then uh, you're going to be able to download the transcript, obviously, and it's also subtitled because you're watching it from, uh, so you've got closed captions while you're watching it. Uh, you've got a small activity, which is an interactive activity to reinforce the learning and provide a sort of small assessment. However, a lot of those activities do not have a right and wrong answer. It very much depends on the learning context you are approaching it from. And uh, then you're going to be able to reflect and you always have a short reflective activities where you're going to be able to add uh, comments and then you'll be able to save those comments and download them if you want to. And then a summary of uh, what you've learned. And uh, these will be downloadable as well. And once you've finished, you've got further resources, which are going to give you pointers to uh, various uh, pedagogic uh, theories that have been uh, man uh, mentioned within uh, the uh, module, as well as uh, tools that may have been uh, mentioned. And we do not train on tools because we believe that uh, tools, proprietary uh, softwares will be far better at uh, keeping that up to date than we could. So the model of uh, five minutes is uh, a model that has worked really well. It has been well received. You can see that you can view a summary of the module in terms of aim, objective, summary, the stage and the framework. So it's referring to our uh, digital teaching professional framework. And you'll be able to download this uh, if you want. And uh, you also have the transcript, which is downloadable, and you've got a button to download it uh, within uh, your um, within the video itself. Vicky. And then you can download your notes as well if you want mm. to. Uh, Vicky, uh, one of the things that impressed me with this work was the kind of iterative accessibility um, stages. Do you want to just in the last minute say something about how you tackled uh, accessible practice, inclusive design, etc.? Okay, so yes, of course, for, um, Alistair. Yeah, so part of our uh, briefing was to have a very inclusive uh, design. And uh, we used Evolve uh, in terms of uh, as a platform, authority platform to create a uh, SCORM uh, modules. And uh, within, uh, we had very clear guidelines as well in terms of the visuals to be used. And as you can see here, uh, you've got a range of age group uh, abilities as well as uh, inclusive uh, uh, ethnic and uh, subject matter. Uh, curriculum. I mean, we, we really try to build on this. We uh, also have uh, within the modules, uh, we tested uh, the accessibility per se, and uh, we've got a strong, we, we give guidance on accessibility itself, and we've got, I believe, 11 modules on accessibility here, but we also have uh, at the bottom uh, an accessibility statement. So although uh, we fought initially at the design stage to really ha uh, um, uh, have a strong accessible and inclusive practice and embedding, adopting a user-centered design process. We realized uh, with the new regulations, and I think Alistair helped us in terms of the auditing of the accessibility um, of the platform, uh, to make it fully accessible and we realized that it wasn't fully accessible it is now i believe we've got uh two if i have a look here uh we've got reporting contacting non-compliance accessibility and uh we only have uh those uh currently uh and we are uh, planning on resolving these issues by and of August, it should be listed somewhere here, yeah, August 21. 
and uh, we're working on both. But in terms That's of great. accessibility, the modules are uh, hopefully very accessible. That's great, Vicky. Thank you very much. You, again, like um, John and his colleagues, you covered a huge amount in a, a short time, but you did it well and you've done it to time. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And, and now we're over to our own uh, Ron Mitchell. If you've got questions for Vicky um, or comments, keep those in coming in the chat pane while we go over to Ron. Thanks, Alastair. Um, I'm not going to turn my camera on because I want to maximize the screen sharing. Hopefully you're seeing my screen share now. And if you're seeing this um, object in the um, learning object that you saw earlier, uh, or, or on the page, it, it, it's locked until after my presentation because I don't want you being distracted um, exploring the environment while I um, present. So I mentioned at the beginning of the, the session that I'm a keen landscape photographer, and this is um, a, a picture on the top of Halim Fell in the Lake District. Um, and one of the questions I think we need to ask in learning design these days is, is 2D imagery um, enough? And as you can see, this is a, a 360 image I can drag around and so on. Um, and what I'm going to do, this is locked for you, but I'm going to click the button to move on to um, my new office. It, Alistair and Lillian don't know about this yet, but I've uh, invested heavily in a new building. And this is my office. I put a few pictures up, but I'm still decorating and so on. Um, there's a little help guide. You'll be able to access this here, which talks about how this resource was created. And there's some video recordings there. And I link to an accessible format for uh, screen reader users in particular. Um, but my quick presentation, I'm going to rush through this because we're trying to catch up the time. This is a true story. Some of it may, may seem like a sales pitch. It really isn't. The product is completely free. The end of the story is up to you. It will depend on what you explore and what you do long after this session. Uh, unfortunately, there should not be any zombies. A bit background of me, um, I've worked in education for far longer than I care to mention, um, providing training, development and consultancy across the UK these days and, and some internationally. I'm one of the core Xerti developers and I work directly with universities and colleges and other organisations, not only in creating learning materials, but more importantly, helping others to create their own materials and, and also some customization and specialist development and so on. Uh, I only have 10 minutes for this, so I'm not going to I'm going to whiz through very rapidly because I want to get on to showing you some of the different learning uh, design examples. Um, but what I would encourage you to do um, is watch the recording from the Xerti 21 conference uh, delivered by Lillian on how to grow Xerti super users. <clears throat> And she posed the question during that as to the, the beginning of this di uh, distribution curve of, of skills and usage, um, a name of the undigital or the digitalizing. Um, and I noticed just last week a, a presentation from Jim Harris from the University of Nottingham that referred to caves, colleagues against virtually everything, um, or maybe the unwilling is another, another word. Now, so that's all a bit unfair. I think that the main point here is that any digital learning design journey that we're all on needs to have access to the right tools and support. And in most cases, Xerti is that perfect tool. Um, some key questions and barriers here. If you don't currently use Xerti and don't plan to ever use Xerti, why not? By all means, post in the text chat, but I'm gonna continue because as I said, we're, we're short of time. So comments I've heard over the years, I looked at Xerti, but I prefer some such other tool. Xerti is so outdated. I don't like how it looks and the click next, click next interface is simply not engaging. Xerti can't do what I want it to do. Some other tool allows me to do so much more. I think Xerti is too complicated to learn. Some other tool is so much easier. I would love to use Xerti, but my organization doesn't provide or support it. Um, there's lots of answers to that. You can read these in your own time that I put here, but also I did a presentation at a previous conference and there's the presentation and the recording that again, you can view in your own time. The main point really is 
which um, facilities and features does your first choice tool provide? One of the reasons we use um, Xerti in the future teacher project is not only because it's free and open source, but also this collaborative offering is a big part of what Lillian, Alistair and myself do on a, on a regular basis, but also as we did in the, the first three years of the project um, as the wider project. And also the, the API, uh, the X API functionality is a big part. So what about learning design? Well, the possibilities are endless and it's certainly not limited to click next, click next type uh, activities and resources. So we'll come on to that. Here's a jokey point. One of the key barriers with commercial tools, and remember my focus here is on everyone in your organization, not necessarily the specialist whose job it is to create resources, but every single uh, teacher and support staff and possibly every single learner and when you look at the cost of commercial tools this is just a jokey mock-up but you get the idea if you want unlimited users and unlimited projects it costs a fortune with Xerti as long as you've got an in, in house installation all of these kind of so-called levels are, are completely free and there's been some text chat discussing how um, the increase in use of Xerti because of the pandemic has happened. Um, we have um, lots of recordings, lots of resources from free previous conferences that are all linked here and I'll point you to uh, other examples there. And, and the main point is that the possibilities are endless. So here's a quick summary at this part of the presentation. And these are made up anecdotal stats, if you like, um, but I think they're probably quite accurate. Xerti installations used by hundreds of organizations, Xerti learning objects created by thousands of different authors and hundreds of thousands of Xerti LOs created and interacted with millions of, with by millions of learners. I, I know Julian's in the list. And I'm not sure whether you think those stats are accurate. The main point is that a huge usage and yet we still hear comments like Xerti seems to be the best kept secret in the e-learning world. We have a Padlet that's linked here and linked in other places in my presentation that if you've got good examples, whether it's Xerti or other resources, please share them and we can, we can come on to that. So I mentioned back to this interface that I've invested heavily. I've also got a new developer room um, and there's some resources linked here. So one of the uh, key uh, focus of the Xerti development team is that simple things should be simple and anything should be possible. And you can view this, the resources linked in this um, room in your own time. So there's an interactive guide here where you can, that we've shared previously, that you can learn about some of those key features. There's a, um, a state of the project recording that we did a, a little while ago in April. Um, about some of the new features and we talk through some of the new features there. If you're really interested in learning design and extending it to its fullest extent, then all the functionality about Xerti and XAPI and LTI and adaptive content and so on is linked here. And there's a, a recording. If you move around the room here, um, there's links to our demonstrators of the main Xerti template and then the bootstrap template and also a link to our release notes. Um, it's a nice picture here of um, a previous group on one of the Xerti conferences. Um, you can explore all of this in your own time. What we're going to do though, and the main bit I want to do is go into the exhibition room. Um, and it looks like a nice sunny day outside, but what we're actually going to look at is some of these um, resources that are linked here. So we have a, a link to Xerti collections, which is Lots of examples from different universities, including Nottingham and York and um, Cardiff and examples, which again, the short summaries, but really the value is in exploring those resources in your own time. I mentioned the videos, there's lots of videos linked there. Accessibility is a key part, and there's some examples of our accessibility resources, but also an example from UWE and an example from York that again, you can explore in your own time. The main thing I wanted to talk about is this set of different learning designs. Um, and one of the things is that um, this, this kind of notion that Xerti is only click next. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. If we look at this example from Cardiff, it's very straightforward. There's, there's um, click next and, and lots of content in there, lots of learning, but it is a linear navigation. Although with all Xerti resources, you have the ability to, as a learner, to, to choose whatever page you want to jump to. So 
there really shouldn't be any kind of negative um, comment about that. Uh, there's an example here from um, York, which um, is a bootstrap template. And one of the things when I deliver training that people will often say, I just built an app because this is designed to work extremely well on a, a mobile phone. And that's the whole reason that resource has been opened. Um, sorry, I need to just go back to that page again. Um, so the bootstrap template is a great starting point and the productivity that that affords even to completely new users is really great. Um, Sam the dog is a great example of problem-based learning from University of Nottingham and there's a whole sequence of these. So you've got information given, then reflective prompts, uh, more interactions and the complexity moves on as the learning design proceeds. And there's lots of different um, storytelling and problem solving examples linked here that you can explore in your own time. Uh, there's another one here from, I think created by Faye at Nottingham, that's a kind of demonstrator really of differentiated um, paths based on your interaction and your choices. Whether you believe about the digital native and digital immigrant um, idea, you, you know, it, it's a good example of that kind of way of uh, demonstrating. There's a, another one here where there's no text. Um, I'm sure you all recognize the story and you can navigate and choose and, and browse through the things. So I've heard the bell from Alistair. I'm gonna um, come back out of this room. Like I say, there's lots of examples here. Um, and we have a menu. Um, and one of the things that happened in the recent um, uh, Xerti 21 conference is that it became apparent how keen people are on things like escape rooms. Um, so we have a white room here that's listed and all of the hotspots and so on are locked. Um, and have a little kind of challenge. It's not a very challenging um, example, but um, there's a there's a a term I used, and I'm going to give the game away now, um, which was caves. And now that's unlocked some of these extra features in the escape room, and I can move around. And now the, uh, for example, the recording that Inga, our colleague, gave about escape rooms and the resource she used. And then there's a, a couple more here from a couple of other people that presented um, about escape rooms in the conference. Um, and then finally, if you move around, um, there's a, a tip and a, uh, a question um, I've got, and we can escape this room and go back to the exhibition room. So this is all created direct in Xerti. The, the images are obviously taken with a 360 camera and then added, but all the hotspots, all the interactions and all the um, resources that you then link to and explore are um, developed and created in, in uh, Xerti. If I go back to um, my training room, what I've also done, because people were likely to ask about accessibility, if you were viewing this with a screen reader, you will hear as a screen reader user a link to an alternative format. And all I've done there is basically created a link to all of the same resources that we just looked at, um, but they're, um, they're, they're, you're not using the 360 room then, you're just you're kind of viewing them um, without having to do that as a screen reader user. I'll leave it up to you in terms of which is likely to be more engaging. Okay, I'm going to stop my screen sharing. I actually know, switch back to the, the next resource um, because it's the open mic discussion. <laughs> we have very few minutes left for an open mic, but I am sure I'm sure you agree that with our three presenters, we've tried to make sure that we are um, kind of answering everybody's curious uh, needs uh, when they signed up for the uh, session. Um, so, uh, Paul's asking in the chat, did I miss the link to the room? Um, do you mean the, uh, the room that Ron was going to share his, his virtual room? Um, I think we can get it. Yeah. 
uh, we will we will have access to it in the learning resource. Um, and the learning resource link is. I'm just I'll put that. Okay, you got that. Yep. Well, yeah. there's a direct link to my presentation, and uh, as I mentioned, it, it went live at one forty ish. So mm. um, you can now click on that first landscape image button, and you'll get into the rooms that I've demonstrated. That's brilliant. Uh, Paul Driver's asking, they look like 360 CGI images. Were they bespoke or from an image bank? Uh, well, see, you've caught me now. I, I, I wanted to tell you that true story that it's my my new office and my new training room and developer room. Unfortunately, uh, no such thing. I've had to use um, 360 images from elsewhere. I did take the landscape image, but the others are um, uh, images I grabbed from elsewhere. And I think, I mean, that that's a case in point. I mean, compared to those of us who are old enough to have done e-learning like from 20 years ago, you had to kind of almost make everything from scratch, but there's so many resources now. You don't even have to make a video from scratch. You know, you, you can kind of start with elements um, that, that have already been created. So uh, any kind of engagement related resources, we can always Google for and find, can't we? Um, so yeah, any other questions that people have um, for either John and his GTAs, uh, for Vicky and for Ron, feel free to uh, turn on your mic or ask questions in the chat. The York example, Kyron's asking if there's a link to the York example. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I don't know, what was that the um, Arc Gis one, Ron, that you added? Or were there a few? Yeah, well, they're, they're all in my resource. You can navigate the same way I did and, and explore them in your own time. Yeah. So, Karen, if you can pop into Ron's virtual office room <laughs> through our learning resource, um, you will certainly be able to uh, find the uh, examples. They're, they're all in the ex exhibition room. Mm. So we have a question. How does Xerti and H5P differ? I guess that's a, um, a question for me. Uh, it's not. You know, it, as far as I'm concerned, it shouldn't be either or. You can use H5P together with Xerti um, and embed H5P resources in your Xerti resources. Um, there are, uh, you know, we don't have time to go into the detail of the, the pros and cons, but if you look at those checklists in my introduction presentation, you can do your own comparisons as to what features uh, each tool provides. Yeah, uh, Ross is saying uh, uh, they love the ex Xerti exhibition room idea and where we can't wait to get our hands on the 360 either because um, with students possibly not joining us till week six of, uh, you know, um, coming from abroad, etc. Giving them the chance to kind of engage with your campus in an interactive way is going to be so good. Up to now, we've had 360 views of our labs, for instance, but being able to click on and then launch, you know, a little bit more information, a podcast, uh, a bit of a video is, is going to be very, very useful. So everyone wants you now, Ron. Uh, shall I share your email address? Um, I'd rather it not go in the text chat, but you can, the, there are links in my presentation to uh, contact me via contact form. So you can do that and then I'll get an email and reply. Um, yeah. Question and about um, does Xerti support uh, 360 video? Um, 
the what I've demonstrated is where you can add all the hotspots and interactions uh, direct in Xerti. That isn't yet available for doing so via video, but um, I've been using 360 with Xerti for many years by kind of additional code and so on. So you can already do that, but it is in our plans to add similar functionality for interactive video. And we do have a new interactive video page that's going to be available in the, uh, the next release, but I'm not sure that it includes 360 video and the the 360 image at the moment is that's in the release that's about to come out is it yes. or is that really yes. okay in 3.10 3. yeah next weekend <laughs> <laughs> next weekend is like the sign you you get when you go into a pub that says free beer tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> We should probably in, uh, cover the last few pages yep. very quickly. Mm -hmm. There's a page about us that you can access. And in fact, there's contact details there. Um, uh, so you can follow that. <clears> link. Um, next steps, our wonderful world of webinars. So if you're keen to, or we'd, we'd be keen for you to um, express interest, if you'd like to do a, a guest slot on that session. Um, we've delayed it until October because September is always a busy period. And I'm sure you don't want to join a webinar from us in uh, in July or August either. <clears throat> um, we usually ask you to do uh, a bit of a reflection and type in what one thing. We'll come back to that. There's a page about this resource. And then when you do explore it in your own time, there's also this kind of results page that will enable you to track what you've seen and how much of it is seen and if you've missed anything and so on. Um, so we'll put a link to this what one thing in the text chat if it I've doesn't work that, yeah. in, yep. um, you can respond via um, uh, the, the text chat in zoom instead but the idea about doing it in uh, the text wall embedded in the page is that you can then instantly access that afterwards and if I on my shared screen view the messages we'll see whether there's been any responses yet yeah so I've added a link to the text wall directly rather than through the Xerti object. I noticed earlier on when everyone was diving into the Xerti object that it was maybe less responsive, like the Menti page. Um, so if you go directly to the text wall, that should probably um, be a bit more responsive uh, for people. And one of the things I popped in the chat a little earlier that people may have missed was, um, We've looked at some really sophisticated stuff today, you know, from from John's amazingly sophisticated kind of online game and simulation to Ron's expertise with, um, you know, using Xerti um, on steroids and Vicky's kind of giant program of creating hundreds of learning objects and ensuring quality assurance, etc. But many of you won't be in that position. Many of you will be creating often quite simple content that you're putting together on your VLE for students. So do have a look at the um, the checklist. The I think I've, have I still got it in my... Uh, the scary checklist. The scary checklist, yeah, I think that's the 129. Yeah, there we are. Um, do have a look at that because it's the kind of thing you could look at and apply to, uh, to a single session that you're doing with students, um, taking into account your your PowerPoint presentation, perhaps, or your, you know, a couple of documents and a link to a, a video, whatever it may be, um, and do do use that in a kind of a way that is appropriate to the context you're working in, and don't be put off by the fact that you know you might be doing simple things technologically because you can do some sophisticated teaching and learning even with very simple technology. No, that's brilliant. And it's two o'clock. I'm just going to stop the recording here.